translation of the title of my talk, which I gave as Queering Animal Liberation, is Making Animal Liberation More Queer. And I think that's great. That's exactly what I want to do. Why? Because love, in all of its wild queerness, is the most powerful force of propulsive energy we have and can also help us figure out what we need to do. Let me explain by reading just a little passage from this book, Biological Exuberance, by a Canadian scientist. What I can hear is the crowd. It's very strange. But what I would like you to do, if you can, even though we're in this bright, crowded, loud place with so many apes, is try to imagine what I'm about to describe here. If you close your eyes, maybe, or not. I never close my eyes in public, but maybe you feel comfortable doing that. And listen. In the dimly lit undergrowth of a Central American rainforest, jewel-like male hummingbirds flit through the vegetation, pausing to briefly mate now with a male, now with a female. A whale glides through the dark and icy waters of the Arctic, then surges toward the surface in a playful frenzy of churning water and splashing, her fins and tails caressing another female. Drifting off to sleep, two male monkeys lie gently in each other's arms, cradled by one of the ancient jungles of Asia. Those are just three descriptions of the more than 300 kinds of non-human animals who participate in same-sex courtship and co-parenting and affection and pair bonding and, yes, sex. The world is, as the biologist J.B.S. Haldane once said, the world is not only queerer than we suppose, it is queerer than we can suppose. So beyond this crowded, human-constructed venue is a world that is teeming with queer eros. By eros, I mean love. By eros, I mean the impulse to make contact, to have loving, affectionate, mutually sustainable relationships. The world beyond this venue is teeming with queer eros, with animals reaching out for one another in so many ways, not only in partnership, but in friendship. In friendship that may be same sex, that may be different sex, in, in friendship that might cross borders of all kinds, including borders of species. And we are part of that world. We're not separate from it, no matter how hard we may try to feel like we are above it. Huh? And so if there's nothing else that you take away from what I say today, what I want you to know is that that queer arrows, that impulse of those monkeys to cuddle up together, in the forest, that queer eros lives in you too, regardless of what your sexual orientation may be. You, you, you hear me? You understand what I'm saying? OK. Good. So remember that. 
Now, I come from Vine Sanctuary in Vermont. And as the introducer said, more than 600 animals uh, now live in our multi-species community, including hundreds of chickens, 40 cows, a dozen or so sheep, some goats, turkeys, guinea fowl, 45 ducks, emus, alpacas, all living in harmony. But we started out as a sanctuary for chickens on a little bit of land in the state of Maryland in the United States, um, in the part of the country where factory farming of chickens was invented. And so we were a little sanctuary, just a few acres, literally surrounded by factory farms. Um, and the story that I want to tell you today dates to back then. So try to imagine this little refuge for birds on a peninsula where they kill and cut up more than a million birds every day. But where the people who started the refuge understood that whatever you can do for whoever you can do it might mean the world to them. And the story that I have to tell you concerns two ducks who came to us after being rescued from a foie gras factory. Do you all know about foie gras? Okay. So these ducks came to us, it was a group of eight ducks who came to us from some of the worst suffering that human beings have inflicted on animals ever. And yet, when they came, they were so delightful, so open to new experiences, so interested in the chickens and interested in us. And of course, talking, talking, talking all the time. How many people here know ducks? How many people here have met ducks? Oh, not so many. That's a shame. Because ducks are delightful. They're just <laughs> talking to each other all the time, looking, looking, talking, looking, just involved. So I was a little bit nervous about taking care of these ducks because I'd taken care of chickens for a few years, but these were our first ducks. So I was maybe a little bit overprotective. One day, but I couldn't help but notice that these ducks were just so friendly. Like they were bigger than the chickens, and yet they were very polite to the chickens. Like if there was a new chicken who had just come and was scared and didn't quite know how to go into the um, barn, they would stand to the side and, and, and not crowd her until she got in. Just little bits of kindness like that from these ducks who had known nothing but unkindness their whole lives uh, made me fall in love with them. Now, unfortunately, we couldn't keep the eight ducks together because we didn't have enough room in either of our coops for them. So we, put, we looked and saw who was friends with who, and we moved four into one building and four into another building. Um, and these two buildings were some distance from each other, and they each had their own yards. Hmm? So one day I come out in the afternoon to refresh waters and clean coops, etc., and I see the two of the ducks are fighting. And I'm like, what? No, you no fighting. You can't fight here. This is a sanctuary. Like, even the former fighting roosters do not fight here. Um, so I tried to figure out who was the aggressor. And then I took the one who I thought was being attacked, and I, I moved him over to the other building, right, where he would be safe. I did what I was going to do. I went back in the house. I came out about an, an hour later, and they were fighting again. Now, that might not sound as amazing to you as it was to me, but in order to be together to be fighting again, what had to happen was that the one I had moved had to walk through the yard, climb a 12-foot fence, walk through the woods, make a sharp left turn, walk down the road, 
make another left turn, and then climb another fence to get to this person he was fighting with again. So I separated them, went about my business, maybe cleaned the coop, put out some fresh food, went back inside, came back out, and I found them talk, 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 talking through the fence, which meant that the one had gone through that whole gambit. And so I thought, okay, well, maybe they're just friends, but they were having an argument, and now they're working it out. So I went ahead and lifted him back in, turned around, refilled some water bowls, turned around again. They were fighting again at least three times. I separated them before I literally hit my forehead with my hand and realized that that was not, in fact, fighting. It was sex. <laughs> they were boyfriends. Uh, so we called them Jean-Paul and Jean-Claude. And, um, and, um, and once I stopped interfering with their relationship, they lived together at the sanctuary for nine years. Um, they slept in the coop together each night. They socialized together each day. I'm not saying they were monogamous, um, because ducks tend not to be. Um, but they were clearly each other's primary partner. I guess they were what, ducks are what people tend to call polyamorous now. Yeah. Um, and then um, nine years later, when um, Jean Claude started to fade and eventually died from the liver disease that was probably due to his um, foie gras experiences, um, uh, Jean Paul then died within a week, even though he had seemed perfectly healthy. So, what can we learn from this story of? two queer ducks. Well, I can tell you some of the things that that experience got me to start thinking about. It really got me to start thinking about linkages between the exploitation of animals and the oppression of LGBTQ um, people. Um, Because even though hundreds of non-human animals um, participate in same-sex relationships of various kinds, and even though um, same-sex relationships um, uh, ha uh, 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 have existed in every human culture so far as, 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 as we know, um, one of the most um, damaging and common things that is said to LGBTQ people is it's not natural, right? Um, and the naturalness or so-called naturalness of heterosexuality tends to be communicated to us uh, when we're very, very young um, and often is communicated to us through animals. Animals are portrayed on um, nature shows, um, on, at zoos, in children's books, as relentlessly heterosexual. Yes? Yes? And, and, and even those who are telling us that they're telling us the scientific truth, especially if you watch these nature shows, all of life is uh, portrayed as though it is a struggle of the heterosexuals to mate and move their genes into the next generation, right? You watch these wildlife shows and it's all about the birds trying to save their eggs or the who knows what kind of animal competing with each other to survive and reproduce, right? And so, what 
what I realized was that portraying animals as relentlessly heterosexual as, as, as reproducing automatons um, ends up hurting animals and people both. Um, so this is an example of an intersection between two different kinds of oppression. They, or, or what seem like different kinds of oppression, but they have a common root, right? And so this portrayal of animals as if they were reproducing automatons, interested only in heterosexual sex for purposes of reproduction, diminishes animals. Um, it diminishes them by being a lie about them, but it also diminishes them by, by denying their capacity for love by denying their capacity to do something just because it feels good, rather than because it's going to leave, lead to offspring, right? And so if you're thinking of animals as these reproducing automatons, then it's much easier to lock them up in a vivisection lab, huh? Or to confine them on a factory farm, or to deny their rights in other ways, right? So this hurts animals, but at the same time, the portrayal of anything other than reproductive heterosexuality as unnatural obviously has very negative knock-on effects against LGBTQ people, really, and any people um, who depart from that narrowly circumscribed norm, which is just one of the many ways that people can be, but gets portrayed as the only normal way, yeah? So that's one link, and it hurts everybody. Um, but this is also linked to, um, so we're, we're told not only what's unnatural, but what's natural. And, 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 and animals are also used in the construction of uh, what feminists would call toxic masculinity, as if it were natural maleness. Hmm? And so, for example, uh, roosters used in cockfighting are subjected to so many tortures that you're so very lucky we're running late because that means I won't describe those tortures to you. Um, but they are, they are subjected to so many tortures in order to trick them and terrorize them and terrify them into fighting each other to the death. Why? because roosters are considered exemplars of masculinity. Um, it's not only in English, but in many, many languages around the world where there's a word that both means rooster and penis. Um, in, 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 um, in English, it's cock, yeah? Um, but, but it's not only in English. Um, the, the, this association between roosters and masculinity goes back millennia. And it, and it, along with other portrayals of stereotyped gender roles, including stereotyped portrayals of animals in children's media, by zoos, and in other ways, um, helps to create the idea that our socially constructed ideas about masculinity or femininity are natural. Does that make sense? I'm telling you all these scholarly things while like, we're hearing all this hubbub, so I, I, hope it, I, hope, I, hope, I hope it's going through because this is really very dangerous, right? This idea that um, uh, violent aggression and competition is somehow inherent to maleness, this is a very damaging idea. And it, and it hurts both males and females, right? It hurts those who are the victims of sexual or domestic violence, um, but it also hurts boys um, who are raised um, uh, to squelch their softer feelings and encourage to become competitive and violent beings, yes? So yet again, it hurts everybody, and it's a way that we use animals in ways that hurt them, but also hurt people and end up hurting everybody. Very quickly, I also want to touch on this whole issue of what, what eco-feminists call reprocentrism, which is the idea that, that reproduction is central to everything. 
Because reprocentrism not only underlies the oppression of LGBTQ people and not only um, factors into toxic gender roles, but reprocentrism tells people you're not an adult unless you've reproduced. Reprocentrism is therefore one of the drivers of climate change, right? You want to under if you've ever been curious how how LGBTQ issues and climate change intersect, this is one of them. Um, we're with our seven billion people on the planet right now, um, and we're still within this dominant paradigm that encourages people to reproduce. Um, and, and, and says that adulthood only comes when you reproduce. But it's worse than that because reprocentrism is also built into capitalism. Capitalism is an economic system that's inherently unbalanced because there's always people pulling money out to put into their private profit pockets, yes? So it's not balanced like a barter system might be where everybody's equal, yeah? And so what that means is capitalism constantly needs new markets, except, uh-oh, due to colonialism, there aren't any more markets to conquest. And so now what does capitalism need us to do? It needs us to trick us into buying more and more and more different, different kinds of stuff, right? We're in the era that's called late consumer capitalism, and it is killing the planet. So I'm super happy to see the tens of thousands of people here, but I do want to remind us all that as happy as I am about vegan cheese notwithstanding, we cannot consume our way to animal liberation. We cannot consume our way to animal liberation. But what can we do? Well, let's, let's go back to that story of the two ducks, huh? And what else can we learn? So we learned some of the linkages between um, uh, uh, ideas or practices that hurt animals and ideas or practices that hurt people. Huh? Um, but let's, let's, let's look at my role in that um, situation where I kept splitting the ducks up, thinking that they were fighting, even though they were boyfriends. I had already read this book. I knew that all male ducks are functionally bisexual. And yet the power of these ideas led me, and I'm sure the power of the idea that males are aggressive. So here I was trying to take care of these ducks, and I kept separating a pair bond. Huh? And I would suggest that it's because these stereotypes about gender and what's natural go very deep, even for those of us who have done some work to try and teach ourselves otherwise. Huh? But what I really want you to understand is that this, this was a failure of analysis on my part that was also a failure of empathy. I really wanted to take care of them and instead, I did something that if they wouldn't have fought back against me by constantly coming back together, um, would have done them real damage. Um, and, and that's just uh, something for all of us who are animal advocates to understand, um, that we need to use real empathy. And I'm sorry if you missed the morning presentation by Lori Gruen on Entangled Empathy, but I definitely suggest you read that book, Entangled Empathy. Um, I wrote the afterword. Um, because we need to understand, we are not the voice of the voiceless. Animals have their own voices, right? The problem is that people don't listen. Um, we need to understand that if we don't make an affirmative effort to very carefully and empathically imagine what it is that animals might like us to do as their allies, 
then we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to choose to do things that aren't what animals would want us to do. So I really want to encourage everybody here never to think about yourself as like a leader of the animal liberation movement, but rather to think of yourself as an ally of animals who are always seeking their own liberation, because they are. And then one more story, because check it out. Like, um, that duck, that duck, that duck walked through a yard, climbed a 12-foot fence, walked through a forest, took a sharp left turn, walked down a road, took another left turn, walked up a driveway, and climbed another fence three times, even though a deranged ape kept pulling him away from his boyfriend. And I must have been a scary ape to him too, right? So that is amazing, right? That's amazing that he was able to do that. And what I want to come back to is what I said at the beginning, because that power lives in you. He wanted to be with his boyfriend. He felt the impulse for a real and genuine connection with someone he loved, and he didn't let the deranged ape or the fence or the road or the other fence or anything else stop him from being with his beloved. And we have seen this time and time again among humans too, right? I mean, there have been times, and there still are places, where same-sex relationships are criminalized. You can even get the death penalty. Sometimes interracial relationships have been criminalized. Has that stopped people from loving each other across those borders? No. Why? Because Eros, in all of its queerness, is in fact our most powerful source of energy, and it's endlessly renewable. It lives in all of you, and this is going to be the harder part to remember. It also lives in the heart somewhere of every vivisector or butcher or person who eats a hamburger without even thinking about it. Everyone comes into the world wanting good relationships with others. We're social animals. We're hardwired that way. It's, 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 it's an abusive, mutually hurtful kind of socialization that leads people into callousness and violence, huh? And, 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 and I'm not saying this to say, oh, have sympathy for the vivisector or the butcher. I, I, I certainly have none. Um, but I am saying that that deep, deep wish for a pl the pleasure that comes from real connections, that's the most enjoyable thing in the world. Far more enjoyable than anything you can buy with money. Far more enjoyable than anything you can get by hurting somebody else. And so, what I would like to call out to you to do is try not only to tap into that source of energy within yourself, but remember that within any person you reach, there is that wish. It may be covered up by years and decades of calluses and clogness, but it's there. Uh, and the more that you're able to call out to that in other people, the more that you're able to show people the truly happier and more connected life that comes from not exploiting others, then I think the more successful you'll be. And even at just a very basic strategy level, right? If you want to get dairy farmers to quit exploiting cows, well, yeah, you can do this, that, or the other, but hey, how about giving them some other ways to make a living that will be even more rewarding for them um, and, um, and, 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 and giving them the, the path 
to do that, yeah? So, so this can not only power what we do, but it can help us know what to do. And I'm out of time. Boom. I want you to tap into that source of sustainable energy and to evoke it for others. And if you do that, I do believe that we can reach a safer and more equitable world for all the queer ducks and all the deranged apes too. Thank you. <laughs>